Welcome once again to Superhero Stuff You Should Know. This is dun, 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 the Ben theme, and with me is Andrew Man. That's Indeed. it. That's the name. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's it. <laughs> As we get further along, we just uh, kind of phone in these names that we do. I gave up. <laughs> I gave up. Elf Man. Yeah. Andrew Man. Andrew Man. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was more off of Batman, but also Batman, Elfman, now you're Andrew. Okay, I get it. It's a double, triple it. entendre. <laughs> well, it is the favorite Batman theme among many fans, including us here. It's the S-tier theme in our rankings that we did in our $10 Patreon tier. Uh, it's Danny Elfman's theme for Batman. And this is one of those topics that, like, when it first hit me, I'm just like, eh, I don't know if we could talk a full episode about it. And then I started brainstorming, and I'm like, yeah, we can talk a full episode about this. So, this is the first time we've done you, something like my this. My first tangent of this episode will be the following, Ben. Yes. Do you think that uh, Danny Elfman is drinking a protein shake right now? Probably, considering what he looks like <laughs> these days. <laughs> he, if you guys haven't paid attention, he's fucking jacked these days. <laughs> out, out of all the celebrities to get jacked, <laughs> This is the most surprise. No, second most surprising. The the first most surprising is uh, is uh, what's that redhead dude in Vegas? Um, Carrot top. That- Carrot top, dude. Carrot top got <laughs> jacked too, man. <laughs> oh He's <the> man. Most- <laughs> the the rise of the gingers. Yes. So- oh yeah. He's gi- Elfman's ginger too. Yeah. Elfman's ginger too. Yeah. So I'll I'll pull up his picture real quick. Uh, but yeah, he is uh, the yeah the one who gave us the greatest Batman theme, as a lot of our fans will agree on that. Maybe not as uh, hummed as often as the Neil Hefty one, but like for the serious version of Batman, it is considered to be the top. And so for this episode, I figured we would cover the theme not in terms of like really nitty gritty music theory type of stuff, but more in terms of behind-the-scenes stories of how Elfman got involved with Batman, how he almost didn't get the part of being the composer for Batman, uh, what other music sort of influenced him, and all the times that the theme has been used since the original movies. So that's why we're covering it today, and of course it's coming back with the Flash movie coming out later, of course, because we heard that in the trailer. So Indeed. Let's start with uh, Elfman himself, as pictured here, after another protein shake and workout. So, <laughs> many... Dude, he's got the creatine, yeah. the branch chain amino acids, <laughs> all of it. Chicken and rice. Probably some, uh, maybe a little bit of uh, TRT, too. <laughs> I mean, he's probably over 50, bro. I mean, yeah, which, <laughs> which I've said on the Patreon, I think is perfectly fine. Yeah. <laughs> Not that he needs my fucking your body's approval. Already producing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's like, finally, I can sleep at night. <laughs> These jackasses on the internet finally gave me permission. <laughs> Let me just use this thousand dollar bill that the U.S. Treasury made just to for me to, to wipe my tears. <laughs> so yeah, before before he was wiping his tears with money, Elfman's beginnings, his humble, more humble beginnings, come from <laughs> and you forget uh, Oingo Boingo. So. Uh, Elfman formed the band in the 1970s. He was the lead singer, and it's due to his work with that band that filmmaker Tim Burton wanted him to work with him on the score for his future debut, Pee-wee's Big Adventure. And so a big collaboration was born out of that, uh, and the two would team up again on Beetlejuice. So naturally, when Burton gets the job on Batman, he wants Elfman to come on board. And it seems like, okay, that's smooth sailing from there, right? Not so much, because notorious producer, giant spider lover, John Peters, <laughs> did not want Danny Elfman on this project. Elfman. <laughs> that Oingo Boingo geek. <laughs> because... He's not even jacked yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this time he wasn't. So, uh, at least I don't think so. So, Elfman was known, let, let's think of it in the context, because right now that seems crazy, right? Because Elfman has done so many comic book scores, but at the time in 1989, he was known, known for... Boingo Boingo, he was known for Pee Wee, Beetlejuice, Scrooge, if we're branching outside of uh, the Burton stuff. Like, these are, like, quirky comedies. These are not, like, action scores. And Peters is just like, ah, I don't know about that guy, because he didn't want him to be doing all this funky shit while, you know, <laughs> Batman's supposed to be taken seriously on the big screen. And so Peters' alternative was that he was going to do a sort of inspired by Top Gun, 
a pop soundtrack done by three of the big artists at the time. One, of course, being Prince, which obviously came true. Uh, the others being Michael Jackson and George Michael. Somewhat of an idea of Prince kind of doing songs associated with Joker, Jackson doing stuff for Batman, and George Michael kind of doing the love theme. This also would have been expensive as fuck at the time. So definitely it didn't happen. Th- this was like at the height of Jackson, right? Definitely at the yeah. height of Prince. Mm-hmm. It might have been a little bit after his... Th- well, Thriller was probably 84 or some shit. That's probably his height. It was earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, anyway, Jackson owned the 80s. So it was probably 84. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. So, But to get all three, like Jackson by himself, sure. Prince by himself, obviously happened. George Michael by himself, sure. But all three of them, it just wasn't going to happen. Peters was willing to settle for just Prince. And maybe Prince even collaborating with Elfman. And he pitched this, this idea to Elfman. And Elfman says no. He turns it down at this point. He walks away from the project. They wanted him to co-write the score with Prince, and he was just not willing to do it, and he was willing to walk away from the whole project to do that, which is a huge risk at this time, because he is not a huge composer at this point. Uh, But he felt, he he actually called this the single biggest, most stressful gamble of his career, to walk (laughs) away from that. Uh, Because it could have just ended with you know, you'll never work in this town again. And then they just put their Prince soundtrack on there. Uh, so he kind of needed to prove himself for this because there was already kind of this dispute with Peters, this big time producer and, and him on this project. He just felt like this wasn't the right thing. And it wasn't because he had anything against Prince. It's just that Prince's style, you know, something, you know, quote unquote more funky or twisted was just not going to work for this. He would have loved to have collaborated with, Prince on a score during the time he was alive, but he felt this was not the right project, this is not the right character for something like that. And it's hard to disagree, really. Like, even to this day, some people are just like, eh, the Prince songs take me out of it, uh, because you've got this sort of timeless feel to the movie, and then suddenly you you it, it feels, starts to feel dated when you I get don't, to the Prince music the thing for some is, people. I, I understand that 100%. I can see people thinking that. Yeah. But again, maybe it's because I'm brainwashed because I watched this when I was like five or whatever. Same. But it's just like, it's the Joker being funky with painting. And uh, where I forget where else it shows up at this right now. In the, but, in the parade. But at the parade. Yeah. yeah it's it still, it fits it's, those I don't know. It, it fits the scenes. It's just, it, it doesn't, I could, I, again, I can see why I could take some people out, but it was fairly seamless, I thought. A very good job on um, integrating mm-hmm. all that. Yeah, it, it fits what's there, and like you, it's just like, well, I think we're just brainwashed from having grown up with this movie that just, it's hard to imagine the movie without it. But I think sometimes the yeah. test is like, okay, introduce this movie to somebody who's never seen it before, has maybe seen the more modern Batman movies, they check this one out, what do they think when Prince suddenly shows up? Maybe they're cool with it, maybe they're not. Like I, I think there's some leeway, too, where some people judge older movies by today's standards when I don't think that's really fair, as opposed to other people who might be like, well, this was done in the 80s, so naturally you're going to expect an 80s style or 80s music in there, because that's from where it was. I Uh, think that also, we've talked about this before, but like, Mm -hmm. by the time this movie, well, by the time we were watching this movie on VHS, it felt like Prince was just completely out of the picture, and George Mm -hmm. Michael, like, again, I don't know how well I could have judged the pop culture zeitgeist at the time being like 10 or Mm -hmm. eight, whatever, six, seven, eight or whatever it was. But um, like, it just felt like Prince and George Michael were just solidly left behind in the eighties. Whereas Mm -hmm. Michael Jackson was still around. He was in Simpsons episodes. He was releasing new music. He was part of free Willy, you know, Mm -hmm. like he stayed relevant for the longest time. Mm -hmm. So, um, I guess that's my only point. I, I don't know. It's just like I'm just trying to t- talk about the different differences between these artists now, how we would view them. But um, that's my main comment here. The other, only other relevant comment I have at, at this exact moment is um, I think I did read that Tim Burton said that he wanted to switch to film scoring because being in a band and touring like that, even though he wasn't like going from couch to couch anymore, Oingo, Oingo Boingo, Boingo was a big band. Mm-hmm. He said it was just like it was hard touring life. It's just it's a hard life mm-hmm. to be to be always on tour like that. I don't know. There's some quote out there, but I thought that was interesting. Yeah, I, I could see that. And there's also sort of an element too, I'm sure, of just like something that seems a little more 
you know, evolved or grown up out of it uh, from going into something like that. So I can I can see how his evolution, the evolution of his career took off into yes. into that. And of course, being friends with Tim Burton on top of that. That, that, so, that helped, yes. That helped a lot, yeah. So Tim Burton so, was just an Oingo Boingo fan. Is that how yeah, that happened? He, he, that's what it seems to be. I'm sure other people okay. in the comments might probably have like even more details of that. Like I, I don't, I haven't gone in and found like what was Burton's first Oingo Boingo experience. Like how did he discover Elfman? Like I haven't, I haven't discovered that yet. I'm sure there's an interview out there about mm-hmm. that, either from Burton or Elfman. Go ahead and drop that in the comments. We might just cover that as well in the deeper dive in the Patreon. But uh, it's it's probably him being a fan of the band and then thinking that type of style or sound would be cool for his stuff, and it turned out to be a great pairing. I mean, excellent. Yeah. The best. So of, Some of the best. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just the the way that it just gels with Burton's visuals is is one where it just it almost feels off when it's not a Danny Elfman soundtrack <laughs> yes, score that's to, true. Uh, to Tim Burton. <laughs> So, uh, but Elfman would, believe it or not, at this time, still have to prove himself through the theme song. So, uh, on the Mark Maron podcast, Elfman actually shared the origin story of where uh, he came up with the Batman theme. And it turned out it was when he was in the middle of a flight. He was on a busy flight, and Elfman elected that, you know, he didn't want to forget the song that was coming to him, the tune that was coming to him for the Batman theme. So he kept going to the bathroom to record the song on a little tape recorder so he wouldn't forget it. However, because he was trying to keep developing it, he kept going back and forth to the bathroom. So, uh, Andrew, I'm going to have you read off his, oh, uh, his man. quote about the uh, the rest of the story. That hit me at the where's basketball time. On the way home, the thing fucking hits me. And it was like, what do I do? I'm on a 747. How do I do this? I'm going to forget this all. I'm going to land, and they're going to play me. They're going to play some fucking Beatles songs, and I'm going to forget everything. I couldn't couldn't do this with the guy sitting next to me. Ten minutes later, I am back in the bathroom, and I open the door, and there, and this time, there are three flight attendants, and they were probably going, what the fuck? He's taking a lot of shits. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and also he commented, yeah, th- th- there's an even longer quote here of like he commented how like you can't do that much blow, you can't shoot up that often, so it can't be drugs either. <laughs> I mean, the coke was the drug of the '80s, and so, he was I mean, maybe uh, he was, he was doing that at the same time. <laughs> but yeah, we never know. <laughs> in this context, he was he says that he was trying to come up with a Batman theme. So it's it's in midair that he comes up with a Batman theme, comes home, puts it down, and it ends up being the iconic theme that uh, we we all know and love. And some people have brought up as well the influence of one of his main inspirations, who is Bernard Herrmann. So Bernard Herrmann is one of the just like how Elfman is known for collaborating with Tim Burton, Herrmann is known for collaborating with Alfred Hitchcock. And so he's most famous for the psycho theme uh, that everyone quotes. But he's also done a few others, such as Journey to the Center of the Earth and Mysterious Island, two of which have been cited by people as having some similarities to the Batman theme, especially Journey to the Center of the Earth. So on the $10 tier at one point, uh, I played a track called Mountaintop slash Sunrise slash Rope slash Torch slash March. That's the name of it? (laughs) I, I think it's just because they combined all the little cues because it's just, I'm sure it's like mountaintop, which is like him playing there, you know, some trombone plays a horn for like two seconds and then it cuts out in the movie and then oh, sunrise, and then, yeah. you know, and then for the soundtrack, we're like, well, this is stupid to put it in like one track. So we're just going to edit them all together into one, like four minute suite of all these different like cues, because otherwise it's just kind of dumb to listen to a two second track or something. So that's why it's probably yeah. called that, where it's just mountaintop, that music, sunrise, that music, rope, when a rope comes down, like all that stuff. And um, it, it's during this time that you can kind of hear something that sounds like the Batman theme building up, uh, which I played during uh, that tier. So check that out if you're part of the $10 tier. Otherwise, you can check out uh, the track yourself and judge for yourself. But it's definitely 
an influence on the opening slow beginning of it, but you don't really hear it in terms of like the big march action type of thing that Elfman would turn it into. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll be fair for that. But also there's a bit of a similarity too to the middle section of it, the bridge of Elfman's theme does kind of feel reminiscent of the opening of the 1943 Batman serial theme that I brought up by uh, Lee Zoller that is not the part that's Wagner, but like, is like right before the part that's Wagner in that serial. So uh, it feels somewhat similar. But the theme song is what totally won over John Peters, and Peters went from being a naysayer to being an absolute fan. Supposedly, he danced around the room when Elfman played the music for him. Oh, wow. The theme. And uh, I haven't found a source or interview with Elfman to confirm that specific thing. I'm sure it's out there. Dan and I just couldn't find it by the time of this recording. But uh, let us know if you can find a direct quote on that rather than just some IMDb trivia that somebody can, you know, some jackass on the internet can make up. But still, <laughs> uh, what is definitely true is the fact that Peters was a big enough fan of this that it was his idea, according to Elfman, to sell the album just of Elfman's score. Now, this is kind of, in Elfman's mind, felt like it was unheard of at the time because in most cases, like, say, like Top Gun, you would get the Top Gun soundtrack and it would be, like, Danger Zone, of course, and Take My Breath Away with, like, a few tracks of Falter Meyer's soundtrack. You know, it, it would be the score plus the songs. It wouldn't be a whole album of the score and an album of the songs. This was like one of the first time where it was released as a separate album. I so, never thought about that. So Batman 89 was the first time they released the score kind of in full uh, on its it, own. On its own, separate from songs. I mean, I think they still sold scores. Uh, if it, But if it was like, say... Oh, if it had movie, only, if it had it was, only uh, exactly. score. If yeah. it was only score. Like, let's say it was a James Bond movie. It would be just one album with the songs yeah, that were yeah. there and the score as opposed to this, where it was completely separate. So there were two albums that were out there, one with Prince's music that had the, you know, the the logo uh, with the bat against the emblem, and the Elfman soundtrack, which was known for having the shot of the bat wing against the moon. Uh, and that's the one that you wanted, of course, <laughs> was, yes. was that one uh, for posterity. And so uh, Elfman was skeptical that Peters was actually going to make good on his prog- promise, but... He actually did, and uh, that's the one that people have been listening to ever since, in uh, since 1989. So it looks like uh, this record is eighty dollars on eBay. Hmm. Oh man, I did not pay for that much when I got it <laughs> when I was younger. But oh yeah, it's definitely it's definitely cheaper back then. Yeah. Oh oh, I found one for twenty five bucks. Anyway, keep huh. going, man. Check that out. But uh, the one thing, the one drawback, however, is Elfman was not a fan of how the score sounded in the in both the album and the movie. He says he oh, was wow. unhappy with the dub, the sound mix of it. Um, now, I'm not that big into like sound and audio mixing, so I'm not really sure all the stuff that he's, he's referring to here, but he kind of just felt like he like all the orchestrations that he tried to put in were like kind of basically brought under the basically shifted aside in favor of anything that was loud, any percussion, any like any of the like more, I guess, ver- not verbose, but you know, the, the louder stuff, the flashier shit, you know, uh, and it what it didn't sound the way that he wanted it to. He wanted and, the other, the, the more subtle instruments to have to be more in the mix. I think that's that's kind of what he was talking about, because he goes into how like quote, dubbing had gotten really wonky in those years. We recorded multi-channel recording on three channels, right, center, left, and basically they took the center channel out of the music completely, which sounds very weird. Uh, okay, so, interesting. I, I, okay, yeah. I mean, they, they, if that's the case, I wonder if there's a way he could re- have like a new recording and do it his way. Yeah, uh, I've been curious about that ever since I, I found that quote where I was like, huh. Like that's that's interesting. So anytime that Elfman does it in concert live, that's how to him it should sound. Does it sound different to you? To... Have you seen that live? Uh, I haven't. I've only. I mean, I've seen video footage of it being recorded live, but that's not the same thing as like hearing it yourself on it. I'd love. I do know that they are going to do a Batman '89 in concert type of thing. They they just did that for uh, the Batman with the Giacchino score, but I've been holding out for the '89 one. I'm like, I should go to this one. Uh, oh yeah, that, definitely. So even though I like the Giacchino 
uh, theme still, but like the Elfman one, that's the one that takes us back to childhood. So I, I uh, normally don't, one. I normally don't like to like get dressed up. I don't like wearing suits and mm-hmm. stuffy, but whenever <laughs> last year we went to go see the final fantasy symphony and I was like, I'm, I'm I need to wear a fucking suit for this shit. <laughs> if I'm going to see a goddamn symphony, I'm dressing up. <laughs> so <laughs> that's like one of the few times you'll see me like dressed up. And if I get invited to like, like my, one of my bucket list, I have put this out in the universe. I mm-hmm. don't give a fuck about winning an Academy award or being nominated. I don't, I don't give a fuck about that kind mm-hmm. of a long ways off at this point, but even if it was to happen, but I want to attend and man, I would fucking like, Dress of the fucking nines for that. But anyway, oh, yeah. yeah, Ben, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta dress up. Uh, I'll be date night. I'll, I'll be your date to 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 <laughs> Batman eighty nine uh, in concert. We'll uh, we'll check out the dates and find out. I don't think they've announced when they're gonna do it, but uh, we'll be there at some point. Oh yeah, I want to hear that shit live. Yeah, same here. So it'll. It'll sound the way that Elfman says it should sound, and we'll be able to experience it that way. Yes. So keep that in mind. Anybody who is around the areas where they're you know, going to have that event happen, because I think it's going to be all over the place, not just Los Angeles. Okay. So cool. uh, this score also earned Elfman a Grammy nomination for Best Al- Album or Original Instrumental Background Score, and the Batman theme itself won the 1990 Grammy for Best Instrumental Composition. So, so you Grammy went from zero to sixty. Song. Yeah, pretty much. It's it's this theme, the the part that not the part the the gig that he almost didn't get because he walked away from it. Right. And because he comes up with the Batman theme in the middle of a plane, <laughs> a plane flight, <laughs> and uh, risks making everyone think that he's a you know he's snorting coke in the bathroom incredible he's able to pull this off and get the grammy and cement himself in in film score history and end up being you know it ends up being the first of many iconic scores uh that he does i mean of course the stuff that he does beforehand is still good but this is like what really sends him over the top no one's gotten close man honestly it, like I don't he, think so either i mean no one's gotten i can't the only thing i can think of is the is the Avengers thing that's like bum bum ba something like that? Mm-hmm. Like, but it's still not as good as da 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 da, you know? Yeah, he it's just he cracked the code completely. He did, yeah. And naturally, when it came time for the next movie, they still kept that theme, of course, because uh, it's Elfman. Uh, but it was still after those movies that this theme has carried on into all the like a whole bunch of other versions, other continuities other forms of medium of Batman that we're going to continue covering. So the most famous, of course, that continues using it is Batman the Animated Series. So supposedly, anybody can send us any articles that confirm this, but supposedly they just wanted Danny Elfman to do the, sh- the series itself. They wanted him to score uh, mm-hmm. the episodes, but he was not able to do it. I mean, the guy was busy <laughs> once it came time to, to all this at the time of, like, 1992, 1993. He's done Batman Returns, Dick Tracy. Like, he's, he's going off to all these other scores, yes. other movies. So uh, during Batman 89, he was working with Shirley Walker, who was the conductor and orchestrator of his Batman 89 score. She worked on that movie. And she then, later on in 1990, Elfman wrote the score for The Flash in the 1990 show, and she carried over using his theme and scored the rest of the series. So they did the same arrangement in Batman the Animated Series. It was Elfman's theme. I believe he's the one who arranged it for the iconic opening credits where there's the bank robbery, and then Batman swoops down and, and stops the robbers, and then you see him in his full glory with the lightning behind him. Like That's, I think, Elfman arranging his theme. And uh, Walker then continues and helps carry it on into... Other the early episodes sort of use the Elfman theme a lot. So that includes On Leather Wings, Nothing to Fear, which is the one that introduced Scarecrow, and of course, I know one of your favorites, Feet of Clay, the Clayface two part. Mm-hmm. Um, that in itself was also written by Michael Reeves, who unfortunately recently passed away. Rest in peace. Uh, but he, Reeves, was a big contributor to the Batman animated series and one of the co writers to Mask of the Phantasm. Okay. Uh, so this is a separate theme from the one that Shirley Walker herself wrote for Batman, which is the one used in the Adventures of Batman and Robin when they did that new out, you know, that new intro with Batman and Robin. 
as well as Mask of the Phantasm, where it's being chanted uh, by people in sort of a faux Latin uh, type of song, even though all it really is is, is the names of the people in production. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, this is a different theme. Walker's theme is different from the Elfman one. The series use both. I'm saying, I'm putting that out there because I've seen a lot of confusion out there thinking that the Walker theme is just the Elfman theme. I'm like, eh, technically, yes, if you're talking about this intro that we're showing here, but no, if you're talking about like other times they've used the, the animated series Walker theme. So just putting that clarification out there. Uh, also, for those who are Six Flags fans, they play the Danny Elfman theme when you're waiting in line for a lot of the Batman rides. I haven't been to Six Flags recently, but I figure they probably still use it to this day, I would think. I don't think I they would imagine it. they got to play something. Yeah. So and they got the rights, I guess. Yeah. And it, it just fits, you know, like Batman the Ride is the tie in to the, the Burton verse films. I remember when I went on that ride for the first time, you get off and there's like a, <laughs> there's like a replica of the Michael Keaton. Bat suit, just waiting for you there when you get off. So uh, <laughs> it's it's ingrained in that era. I wouldn't want them to update it. I so, remember it was a really cool roller coaster. I haven't been on it in years, but yeah, it's, same. It's it was a good one. I remember, man, in Atlanta at Six Flags Over Georgia, mm-hmm. there, there was one called the Ninja, and it was like it would like give you whiplash and fuck your neck up the whole time. <laughs> and then you get on the Batman one, it's like ah, oh, this is just nice this is and nice smooth. One. It's fast but smooth. Ninja, man. If anybody in Atlanta knows what I'm talking about or been to Six Flags Over Georgia, that'd be funny if you commented about that. Nothing to do with Batman, but man, Ninja in the 90s was would, would fucking kill you, dude. <laughs> I I remember it being fast and smooth, too. Like, I remember yeah, it yeah. just being like, this is just a nice, fun ride. I'd go on this again, even if it wasn't Batman-related. The fact that it oh, was yeah. was just the cherry on top. Oh, yeah. Oh, real quick. Real quick sidebar. One of the best roller coasters ever was the Hulk in Universal Studios. In, oh, I haven't uh, gone. I didn't go on that. There was one in Florida back, way back in the day. It, it like there was like no buildup. It just like shot you out of a cannon, basically. <laughs> that one. It was like you know usually you go up the hill and it's kind of a buildup suspense. This one's just like I don't know how they did. I mean, there's some technology that does it, obviously, but just boom, just shot you out like real quick. I was like, damn, this Hulk ride is awesome. <laughs> Man, they just immediate Hulk out. Like yeah, immediate- you're not even you're not even doing the build up of like feeling the feeling of transforming into the Hulk. You're just already the Hulk and you're already it's, smashing. It's like a Bond Bond intro to the <laughs> to the, <laughs> to the roller coaster. I can see that. So uh, yeah, this continued into other continuities in some way. The trailer for Batman Forever used the score from Batman '89, naturally, which. Set up the expectation for seven-year-old me that it was going to be in the movie. And then, of course, the movie starts in the theater. I'm like, what the hell is this? This is not the Elfman theme. You were smarter than me when it comes to this. <laughs> I probably saw I probably saw the trailer. I'm sure I did. I did mm-hmm. not. I mean, I love the Elfman theme, mm-hmm. even when I was a kid. Did I notice that it wasn't in forever when I was a kid, though? No. <laughs> I just... It just... Phew, Golden Thaw's theme does sound though like the Golden Thaw's theme is still pretty good. It's still like in the spirit yeah. of the Elfman one. It's just not the same one. Uh, and I okay, so I did come across an old article scan a long time ago. I should have saved it. Please send it over to us to verify. Composer Elliot Goldenthal said in an interview when he was developing it because they were in post production, they were considering using the Elfman theme and were kind of debating whether to go with it or compose a new one. Obviously, as history shows. They composed the new one, but we could have seen a variation of Goldenthal, you know, doing the Elfman theme, mixing that with all the other themes that he had going on with Riddler and Two-Face and Chase Meridian in this movie. So that could have been interesting uh, on that. But it only really survives as, as being associated with the Schumacher films in the trailers, because even though Goldenthal does do his own Batman theme in Batman Forever, they still end up using Elfman's music for the trailer of Batman and Robin from 1997. So, uh, though I think they did a big mix of both. I think Goldenthal's uh, stuff is still in it as well. It's kind of just a combination. It's a mashup, essentially, in these it's trailers. Just they had to because no one's gotten really close to Elfman, even yeah. <laughs> not then, <laughs> not now, really. I right. mean, I I would love for somebody to like at least be a solid second place, but I don't even know who that'd be. I think Jaquino's is pretty good. I don't know if it's going to 
ever overtake Elfman. It depends on how often we end up because part of the Elfman thing too is is not just it's it's not just in eighty nine. It's in Returns. It's in the animated series. It's in more of the stuff that we're going to be covering. Like it's been in so much. That's kind of it's hard to basically replace that legacy. It's like the John Williams Superman thing. You know, like it, yeah. you're not really going to replace that history so much. You can do your own version, but people are still going to have that association with all the decades of history that this other theme has. Yeah, I mean, well, I guess John Williams is maybe up there. I mean, you can really, you can still hum the Superman theme. Right, <laughs> right. But that was, that was before pro- Elfman. It's before, yeah. Yeah, he's before. He's, Elfman's the best since, since yeah. then, probably. Yeah, I'd say so. But, John Williams you know. still number one, obviously. I think. Yeah. Sorry, Elfman, but I think you probably <laughs> you probably agree with me on that one. Yeah, I mean, comment below on your favorite like superhero <laughs> themes, guys. But uh, I'd say there's a reason why the Williams Superman theme and the Elfman Batman theme keep being used. It's just because they're they're the most iconic for those specific superheroes. And sure, there have been newer themes. I still like the newer themes for Superman and, and Batman, but it's just it's not the same thing. It just doesn't have the same legacy that these themes have. It doesn't seem like they're gonna. They're, it's it's just not as. It's again, it's not as hummable. Mm-hmm. Which I guess not every music needs that. I mean, kind of Hans Zimmer has made really good ones that aren't too hummable. So, yeah, I don't know. We're just attached to this time period. Is really what Indeed. it boils down to. Yeah, and I think most of our audience is too. So I don't think anybody's really going to disagree in the comments about this. Uh, <laughs> Elfman's theme is also used in the opening of the 1998 animated film Batman and Mr. Freeze Sub-Zero for like literally the first 10 seconds or so, um, arranged by composer Michael McQuistian. Uh, So thank you, Michael, for adding that. But of course, it reverts back to the Walker uh, theme throughout the rest of it. But it is kind of, I think Wolfie uh, slash Stefan commented at the time that it kind of felt like, oh, like, remember 89? We're going to make you feel like it's the same thing. Because that's kind of how it feels. But it's not. When they use it. But it's not. It's animated and has Mr. Freeze. Uh, another good use of the theme was in the OnStar Batman commercials. The commercials that have occasionally landed in the S tier with us ranking, outranking a lot of the different movies when it comes to uh, some of their production design with the Gotham City or the Batcave. But these ran in the early 2000s and was kind of the ultimate combination, the ultimate mashup of a little bit of the Schumacher aesthetic with the Burton aesthetic. Of course, it uses the iconic Batmobile from the Burton films, and it also has the Danny Elfman Batman music. So that was the other aspect to it. So yeah, those are uh, cool. It worked. I definitely yeah. caught those in the wild back in the day, and oh, they're uh, great. And, like watched them live, and then forgot about them completely until we went over them again. Or we, <laughs> we you started bringing them up here and yeah. there. But, yeah, uh, yeah. I definitely seen. I saw at least at least one of them. <clears throat> God, was one on a VHS? Or something, I remember. Uh, Not a Batman maybe. one, but it was on... I think one was on like some random movie that I had uh, on VHS. Anyway, maybe. let's keep going. Yeah. Uh, we'll wrap up our coverage of the early 2000s with the theme being used... Let's see if you remember this. In the trailer for 2002's Scooby-Doo. Do you remember the trailer for this? They tried uh, to fake you out. I probably saw it. Okay. So this was a fake out trailer where they pan up to this big mansion and they play the Elfman music, an arrangement of the Elfman music. And they've got a narrator talking about, you know, a hero who's going to be, you know, returning to your screens to save the world. And of course, and they make you think it's the next Batman movie because Batman hasn't been on screen since 1997 with Batman and Robin at this point. Right. And then they show the silhouette of Batman, as we see here. But then they pan around only to reveal that it's Scooby-Doo and that that was the trailer for the first 2002 Scooby-Doo film. Written, okay, I course, probably saw this. Co-head, future co-head of DC Studios, James Gunn. Oh, he did he write this movie? He wrote Scooby-Doo. Dude, the guy never sleeps, bro. We, <laughs> I mean, the trajectory he's been on, it's just been, I mean, there's a reason he's he's where he's at. Yeah. That movie but... was okay. I remember that being all right. I mean, there's even like a shot where it makes it look like they're smoking weed and then it's like, you know, it's smoke coming out of the their van, <laughs> and uh, they're laughing, and then mm-hmm. it cuts to them inside the van, and of course, they're just cooking because they're eating munchies all the time, which again, I know that's a drug thing, but right. in the cartoon, they don't do that. And, you know, it's was, it was, again, another hint at, at that kind of thing. That and, one's for the adults. Yeah. And then, yeah, you know, and then also this, 
again solidifies more and more this sort of connection with Scooby Doo and Batman. Mm-hmm. There's always there's there's they've been like. I mean, I wonder if he's been he's crossed over with Scooby Doo more than anything else outside of D, you know regular superhero DC continuity. He probably probably has dating back to the original show, going through you know Scooby Doo and Batman the Brave and the Bold and uh, the Batman Scooby Doo mystery comics by Charlie Fish. Like those are those are great actually. So and that uh, one episode that scared the ever living fuck out of me, where the Joker oh, is, yeah. a, is a dryad, I think is the name of it. <laughs> Before yeah, the reveal. I before the reveal, look up. I think actually, hold on one second. I'm going to do this right now. Dryad. Yeah, remember we talked about this dryad. Yeah, it is. It is him. Oh my god, dude. Yeah, this is it. So it's D R Y A D. This mm-hmm. is this fucking design. We'll 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 show you after the break. <laughs> this design scared the living fuck out of me when I was a kid. And spoilers for something that's 50 years old, but it uh-huh. turns out to be the Joker. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's uh, let's get, we'll keep show going. We'll after the break. But yeah, yeah. that is uh, <clears throat> kind of the uh, first instance, it feels like, of James Gunn and DC and Batman is this trailer, funny enough. So it's, it's interesting to see where we are now. So uh, that kind of wraps the early 2000s. There's still other instances of this theme being used, but uh, we'll cover that after the break. Hey everyone, so this is Ben. I have a few plugs for my writing. So I am getting my first fiction published. It's going to be published in Metaphoricist Magazine in the April 2023 edition. It is a short story novella called Shortcut to Happily Ever After. The cover that you might see in the video version is based on my story, art done by artist Gabriel Roswell. It'll be available on the Metaphoricist website on the first week of April. The issue itself will be available if you want to buy it on Kindle or on print on Amazon. Uh, The story, real quick, is about Daniel, a hopeless romantic who uses time travel to find love. Whenever he meets someone new, he jumps to the future to see if their relationship lasts, and if it doesn't, he returns to the present to cancel the first date before anyone gets hurt. But when his dating strategy starts ruining the fabric of time, Daniel has to go back and live through every relationship he skipped, discovering what he missed the first time around. So check that out. The uh, links are in the visuals as well as in the uh, basically the links below. But that is at Metaphoricist. That is M-E-T-A-P-H-O-R-O-S-I-S. And the Amazon link will be there as well. So that is my original piece. But if you've been following us on social media, or our YouTube community. I've also announced something else. I've got a couple Batman-related things in the pipeline, collaborating with our friends and fellow podcast, Newverse Creative. We've brought them up on the show before, but they do audio drama adaptations of unmade superhero scripts and other projects. So kind of dramatizing stuff we cover and comment about here. So for them, I'm adapting the Batman 89 comic written by Sam Hamm with art by Joe Quinones, as well as Batman 3, which is going to be an adaptation of the original Batman Forever scripts by Lee and Janet Scott Batchelor and Akiva Goldman. So those will be coming out later this year. Uh, the Batman 3 one will be one that focuses on, of course, the cut subplot of Bruce Wayne's psychological journey. It is the closest thing you will get to the dramatized version of Batman Forever we've been talking about on this podcast since 2019. And that's about all I can say about it for now. But uh, thank you very much. And for the month of April, uh, this is because of the fact that SnyderCon is uh, that month. This month's charity will be for the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. This is the charity that a lot of Snyder Cut fans have donated to in honor of Snyder's daughter, Autumn, who unfortunately committed suicide years ago. Uh, no matter what your opinion is on the Snyder films themselves, I think we can all agree suicide prevention is more than a worthy cause that all of us can support. Obviously, if you or someone you know is having these types of thoughts, seek help. Uh, the AFSP Foundation, they have our, their own helpline and number, and, and they basically are out to help this cause. Uh, so there are people out there who can help you or anyone you know. And the website is afsp.org. Thank you. Just wanted to announce that I have a new podcast called Gaming Gaiden. It's about Japanese to English translation in this first season. It will be 10 episodes each season. If you saw the ranking, every Superman video game two-parter we did here on Superhero Stuff You Should Know, you have seen Mike before. So yes, if you like video games, if you've been interested in Japanese ever, we're going to be talking a lot about just Japan in general. Japanese cultural differences as well. 
And we also are going to have a lot of talk about 90s video game magazines such as Electronic Gaming Monthly, a.k.a. EGM. So stay tuned for Gaming Gaiden Podcast. It's already out now, y'all. I want to tell you about the Patreon.com. Patreon.com slash Superhero Stuff Pod. And on that, you get the $1 tier. Uh, you can join the $1 tier, which gets you the shout out on the board and either visually or orally or both at times. Uh, <laughs> we want to do the oral uh, for the most part uh, for newer people. Uh, and then the $5 tier gets you a whole new show. Uh, this show is every Monday, as you well know, and it's free on YouTube and the What's Nots. And. Um, <laughs> The uh, Patreon show is every Friday at the $5 tier mark. You can, if you want, binge us for five Mm -hmm. bucks. And uh, there's like 150 episodes, uh, almost 150 at this point. And you can, uh, you know, listen to all that content there. Even the stuff that's been released from the vault, none of that has been the full episode as well. So Mm -hmm. (laughs) trying to keep our uh, $5 tier people happy. (laughs) So... um, Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, check that out. And then our $10 tier gets you all of the above. Plus, a uh, it gets you a monthly meetup show where you meet up with us monthly. And it's like a Zoom-like call. And we have a topic at hand or sometimes videos we react to and things like that. And that's at the $10 tier. Um, every tier that you get, like the $5 tier, gets you the $1 tier benefits and the $10 tier gets you the $5 tier benefits and the $1 tier benefits. So mm-hmm. check that out at patreon.com slash superhero stuff pod. We also got the merch, which is Redbubble, superhousepod.redbubble.com and on Threadless, superhero stuff pod.threadless.com. Get your Ben Man and Indeed Wizard mug, shirt, shower curtains, and all the rest artwork by Stephen Santa Cruz. And please send us some audio at superhousepodcast at gmail.com. A bumper would be great. Mm-hmm. You too can be part of the show. I'm Thunderwolf Drew on Instagram and Twitter. Thunderwolf lives as my other YouTube channel, one of my many YouTube channels. And I have uh, also thunderwolfdrew.com. has my whole portfolio in one place except for amanorecon.com. That's A-M-A-N-O-R-E-C-O-N.com. And... That is uh, an original idea that some friends and I are doing where it is R-rated um, Power Rangers meets Stranger Things. That's the quick pitch, and it is not a fan film, original idea. We have a pitch video right now on YouTube and on the Indiegogo page. We're campaigning right now as of this uh, when this episode premieres. And this poster art is by Zachary Jackson Brown art.com and check it out. Please support us on the campaign and more from that soon. Um, but yes, it's, uh, it's bloody. And, um, if you like that kind of thing, check us out and that's it. Ben follow us on social media on Twitter at Superhouse pod, Instagram, superhero stuff pod, where we have some different supplemental stuff. We even, I've even analyzed the martial arts stance that the Keaton, ornament from the flash is in so you can check that out on our instagram superhero stuff pod uh tiktok superhero stuff pod vero superhero stuff pod my website is benwanwriter.com where you can read a whole bunch of spec scripts including gotham vampire elementary the death of sherlock holmes and curb your enthusiasm disneyland if you're fans of any of those shows check them out and let us know what you think my YouTube channel is in the description below, including Doctor Who, The Ronin of Time, an audio drama I write, edit, and narrate with the 8th Doctor, meaning Miyamoto Musashi. My personal Instagram is Ben Juan Ryder. If you like cats, my son, Alfie, my cat, is at Alfie Pennyworth Cat. And if you have an Alfie yourself, then you can get the Whisker Box, the only cat box with a crazy cat lady and gent. And you can even check out another page on that website, superherostuffpod.com slash show notes that includes uh, various show notes for each of our episodes, links to the scripts that we review if they're available online, Amazon links to the stuff we've been talking about, including, you know, Brian Levant's book that he plugged for us, My Life and Toys. So check that out at superherostuffpod.com slash show notes. Lord have mercy, y'all. Do you like hounds? Do you enjoy pooches? 
Do you find yourself enjoying time spent with that of canines? Talking about dogs, y'all. As you might have heard, Superhero Stuff You Should Know has now teamed up with BarkBox. For every month, you get a box for your special canine. Pooches. Or hounds. That's right. One free extra month if you go to BarkBox.com slash Superhero Stuff Pod. Follow the link and you'll get a free extra month valued at $35 and valid for all multi-length plans. So get the BarkBox for your hound, for your pooch, for your canine. Your doggo will thank you. Just a bunch of goddamn near to wills and scallywags. And we're back. And who do we got here, Scoob? Oh my god, dude. This <laughs> is the dryad. Uh, <laughs> if you guys know the Scooby Doo episode, it is a Batman episode, so we're still sort of on point here. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's a uh, and the penguins in it. This is the Joker playing this part, I think. And it just there's something about this design that stuck into my soul that. It just scares the fuck out of me, dude. I think I had nightmares about this when I was a kid, which oh, I guess man. is what they wanted. You never, I you didn't so, grow up yeah. seeing this, though. I don't think I saw. I I didn't grow up seeing this. I did eventually see it, but I was like already probably in high school when somebody you gave were... me a DVD copy of it. So I'm <laughs> just like, ah, it's fun, but like, at, yeah, at that point, I'm too old for this to be oh, that dude. effective. I know we've been had a lot of shout outs this episode, but if you if you too were really traumatized by this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> dryad let me know I'm, mm-hmm. i i seek i seek solidarity uh, i'm sure with, there's with, somebody with uh, those affected by the dryad yeah there's got to be somebody out there all right oh, let's yeah. get sorry to derail so, this once again let's get back to Elfman. Back to, back to danny elfman's <laughs> theme so and his protein again, shakes it, <clears throat> so after danny's workout he was also getting <laughs> you know residuals probably for all the times they use his theme because they continue to use his theme for the dcau Kevin Conroy Batman, they brought the character over to crossover with the superhero Static in 2002, Static Shock. I don't know if you've seen a lot of episodes of this, but uh, Batman crossed Dude, over a lot with Static Shock. I got to tell you, man, 2002, I'm a little bit older than you. I oh, was yeah, that's true. Going, You're probably not watching it at this time. I was going to college, bro. I was graduating <laughs> high school. I, you weren't I had, watching cartoons? I had SATs. I wasn't watching like much of it. I probably was seeing some shit in the theater every now and again, mm-hmm. but... Dude, like Static Shock, I did not even know this existed until a few years ago, to be honest with you. This was well off my radar. Like, there's some years, mm-hmm. like a, a 2002, maybe 2003 a little bit, because I was just leaving high school, my life changing, going to college. And sure. then 2006, I was graduating college. And then, so that, that and 2005 too, a little bit too, especially near the end of it kind of like completely a blur don't didn't watch much of fucking anything uh there's like movies that came out during those two years and shows that like i don't know i didn't know fucking anything about i'm still discovering to this day so static shock is i mean to be fair i've only seen the crossover ones too so uh, it, se- it seems like a good show um yeah very popular i saw a couple uh statics cosplays over at uh, WonderCon this past oh weekend. yeah so it's still Still a popular character. I'm sure if they did a live action version, that would be pretty popular. But uh, this uh, these characters would often team up. Uh, he also teams up with the Justice League at one point. He and Batman and Robin team up against Harley and Ivy. Like he was a regular part of the DCAU starting with season two. And it would also be established that like a future version, an older version of Static, would work with the Terry McGinnis Batman in the Batman Beyond you know timeline. So that was pretty cool. But they did use the Elfman theme when Batman showed up for the first time to cross over with Static. So that was pretty cool. Nice. And then uh, they use it, I think, one more time in the DCAU universe with the 2003 video game Batman Rise of Sin Su, a beat-em-up game set in that continuity where you could play as Batman, Tim Drake, Robin, Nightwing, or Batgirl, and fight Sin Su, not Sun Su, but Sin Su, who's like a villain based <laughs> off of Sun Su. <laughs> <laughs> He's read The Art of War way too many times. You have to take him down. <laughs> you think he know how to spell it at this point. <laughs> uh, he's arranged. This was arranged by composer Matteo Vanas, Vanassi. I'm not sure how to pronounce that, but uh, that's The Rise of Sin Tzu did use the Batman theme done by Elfman. And it would not be the only time that Elfman's theme would be used in video games. The, the biggest use of it, of course, was in the most popular Batman video games. Not the Arkham games, but... Lego Batman. 
<laughs> you thought it was Arkham, didn't you? <laughs> You're wrong. It's the Lego Batman games. Lego Batman the video game, Lego Batman 2, DC Superheroes, and Lego Batman 3, Beyond Gotham. And uh, You guys thought Arkham sold more than this guy? You kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> this is the true king right here. The, the kids most powerful rule. Batman. Yes. The most powerful Batman there is. Also, I looked up Senzu's reviews yeah. on Metacritic. Not bad. Like at a 63 mm. out of 100, it's okay. And then the user Especially score is 8.1 out of 10. Yeah, eight, eight yeah. out of ten. That's like that's decent. This is fine. So that's, like that's fantastic in a pre Arkham Batman video game world. Yeah, that's cool. And the you know the Lego games are always are always good. They're they're no, yeah. nothing but fun. So again, this is a separate Lego Batman from Will Arnett, who's like the most famous yeah. one. But yeah, like you, you can tell your age when you look at the comments for stuff that has to do with the Elfman theme, and most people were talking about like the Burton stuff, and then the younger generation is just like, "This brings me back to Lego Batman," and you're just like, oh, shit. <laughs> "Make you feel old, man." Yeah, it does. So. Composer Rob Westwood would be the one to arrange it into the score, but full tracks of the 1989 soundtrack would actually be used in the games, especially in uh, Lego Batman 2 DC Super Heroes was edited into its own animated movie. You can check it out on HBO Max. Lego Batman DC Super Heroes Unite. They used full tracks from the Elfman theme in a different context. Have you uh, seen it? I did. It is. Is it it's good? good. It's good. It's good. It's uh, not as it's good not, as a movie, though, right? It's not. It's it's different. It's it's different. It's not as good as the as the Lego Batman Will Arnett one because it's not as funny. This one is like it's still funny. It's but it's a kids adventure thing of Batman. Okay, they they, they lean more a, into the action of it. Yeah, and they do give a good arc for Troy Baker does the voice of this Batman, and uh, they give him a good arc across these Lego Batman movies, and they're they're all really good. Uh, and I think this one is kind of special because of how it has that like 89 feel to it due to the Elfman soundtrack being part of it to the point where they recreate the entire opening with the Elfman music right down to ending on the Batman awesome. logo. And they have a director whose last name is Burton. Dude, that's so, crazy. <laughs> I have, I actually haven't the seen Burton's these, Batman. but I, I mean, I'm sure everybody in the theater that saw Lego Batman, the Will Arnett one, Mm-hmm. We it was like, is this like legit good? Like, are we seeing <laughs> right? Are we seeing like kind of greatness right now? Like, it was Indeed. it was like so shocking how ridiculously good it was. I mean, <laughs> that movie was thoroughly satisfying. Mm-hmm. I mean, I guess we were teed up a little bit with the Lego movie being really good one, too. Yeah, yeah, the first one especially. Um, but it was like, damn, they did it again, man. This is they this did. is really legit. So yeah, these these are not quite to to that level. They're like you know directed video type yeah, stuff yeah. or direct cool. streaming, but uh, they're all on HBO Max. I've I've seen pretty much most of them, and they're all pretty fun. So uh, and nice. they use the Elfman theme. So that's another that's another version of Batman to use it. Uh, the Arkhamverse did actually end up using this theme for a specific DLC for Arkham Knight, where you could play in the 1989 Batmobile. This is not, you know, a skin hot. that someone did. Someone that, that actually did a DLC with this. That's so hot, dude. Yep. Uh, not only that, but you could drive through different areas of the Burton style movie set. So you could drive past uh, Wayne Manor from Batman Returns. So you could this drive past the Arctic Zoo from Batman Returns. This was a, kind of a fan made demo, right? Uh, I think that's different. I think this is actually an official DLC for Arkham Knight. For Arkham Knight. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. There was some other fan thing or something, wasn't there? Yeah, yeah. There was a, there was a fan created Burton thing, uh, Burton okay. Batman type of thing, which you know we might discuss at another time. That's cool. Uh, but it is it's another cool thing to pay homage to Arkham Knight, and maybe some of that had to do with the fact that the theme was coming back into uh, onto the big screen because in 2017, the controversial Joss Whedon Justice League cut. Uh, was released, and Whedon brought in Danny Elfman to do the score. Uh, Snyder was taken off of Justice League and replaced by Whedon, and Snyder's choice for composer, Tom Holkenborg, a.k.a. Junkie XL, was not brought along for the ride. Whedon brought on Danny Elfman, whom he worked with on Avengers Age of Ultron. Uh, Elfman's score is controversial, partially due to it bringing its own, you know, his own style of music in the, you know, the vein of you know, Batman 89 and you know, Spider-Man 2002, that is very different from the type of feel of Hans Zimmer and Junkie XL 
in Man of Steel and Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice. So that already did not, you know, it didn't really rub Snyder fans the right way. Uh, and on top of that was a comment he made to uh, Reporte Indigo, where he was asked about whether or not he would carry over Hans Zimmer's theme from Batman vs. Superman. And he said, quote, you'll hear Batman's theme. Batman has only had one theme, as in his own. <laughs> uh, but I'm kind of okay. like, well, if there's anybody who's earned the right to say that, it's him. I, guess, my dude, I guess so, but he's like taking a <laughs> shit on people that came after him. Yeah, this is the other thing, though. Like People did find this disrespectful towards other composers, especially Hans Zimmer, who had done not just Batman vs. Superman, but also the Dark Knight trilogy. I blame it on the uh, TRT therapy. <laughs> yes, he just I, said I too, much, <laughs> too much testosterone coursing through his veins. Mm-hmm. And yeah, uh, he got, he got uh, you know, a little big, big on, big on himself. Yeah, I think so, too. Uh, he kind of explained it a little bit more in a Hollywood Reporter interview, so I'll have you uh, read off what he said uh, okay. there. But uh, he did have an interesting point, because there are certain themes that are iconic that you probably wouldn't want to get replaced. And then there's other themes that or other characters where there could be some flexibility, and a lot of times that tends to be, you know, superheroes. So uh, this is kind of a two-parter. The whole concept that every time a superhero is franchise is rebooted with a new director, then you have to start the music from scratch, is a bullshit idea. It's only for the ego of the director or the composer. Ego, all right? They need to learn the incredible lesson that Star Wars and James Bond have known for ages, which is that keeping these musical connections alive is incredibly satisfying for the people who see those films. There's like four different Spider-Man themes at this at this point, and as a result, he doesn't have a, rec- a recognizable sound. I told the guys at DC, you have a great musical heritage that you should be proud of, and you should keep it alive. And they agreed with me, which is refreshing. And step, <laughs> and I told, <laughs> brother. All right, calm down, Danny. <laughs> I so, feel great, <laughs> Robert Frank. <laughs> In the Justice League score, Elfman also used the John Williams Superman theme as opposed to the Hans Zimmer one from Man of Steel. However, he did still carry over the Hans Zimmer Wonder Woman theme as opposed to using the Wonder Woman theme from the Linda Carter series. Uh, Also notable, people have not brought this up uh, in conjunction with this because they're just like, well, he's just stroking his ego and, you know, he should have just composed a new theme or reused another theme. He did not reuse his Flash theme. He did the Flash theme for the 1990s show. He did not reuse that for Ezra Miller in this. He composed a whole new theme for the Flash uh, on that cut of uh, Justice League. And also worth noting that in Avengers Age of Ultron, he did not reuse his Hulk theme from the 2003 score, uh, but did reuse Alan Silvestri's Avengers theme, of course, for Age of Ultron. So I think it's, you know, maybe some of it is ego, but also I think it's sort of awareness on like what's the most iconic sound to some of these for superman is the john williams one for wonder woman the 1970s theme is not as iconic as like in the batman 66 one and i think because the zimmer theme for wonder woman was so much more popular than well that, know, his that, themes for superman that theme with the sense. wonder woman one in the 70s like wonder woman like yeah, that like, just was not not gonna vibe with a really cinematic <laughs> super cinematic experience version <laughs> Maybe, so, you know what, if they played off of that and kind of, yeah. you know, flipped it and reversed it a little bit and, you know, kind of based it on that, like, they did, like, like, like they've done with the X-Men theme over the years and made mm-hmm. it more cinematic sounding. But, I mean, yeah, I mean X-Men the theme even stuff. lends itself even, even more than the Wonder Woman theme. Like, that, that one's a little mm-hmm. tough, yeah. honestly. Um, anyway, yeah. Yeah, like, my stance on this is I think the themes for Ben Affleck in the Snyder films fit his version of the character better. Like when yeah. when you compare the different cuts of Justice League, it just feels like it fits that visual more uh, naturally because it's it's for Snyder. Uh, and Elfman's score kind of has a weird combination because he's, he's forced to score for something that's a combination of Snyder footage and Whedon footage. So sometimes it feels like Snyder. Other times it's like this weird Hollywood reshoot shit that's going on. But that said... As we've said before, Elfman, Elfman's theme is way more iconic and memorable than either of the Affleck themes in BVS or the Snyder Cut of Justice League, even though I like those themes, but it just doesn't hold a candle in terms of memorability and just the association with the character. So, 
Is it ego when you literally are the best at that point? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, Muhammad Ali, I'm number one. Well, yeah, I guess you well, are, you know, yeah. I mean, at that yeah. time period. <laughs> like, It's hard, yeah. It's yeah. hard. So it's like, I, I don't really picture a world where Elfman uses, <laughs> frankly, an inferior theme for it, uh, for this type of thing. Like, it's just, if you bring Elfman on, I'm like, eh, he's probably going to use his, his Batman theme. And he did, and he was actually encouraged to use it even more so. So I'm going to have you read off a quote that uh, he oh, said man. about uh, a use of this, the use of his theme. Okay. Let me uh, see when it here. comes to Joss Whedon was talking to him about this. So There was a moment where the Batmobile shoots out of, out of a thing, and he goes, Go batshit crazy here! Batman the shit out of it! <laughs> when I'm using the Batman theme, I'm using the melodic sense of it. I wasn't doing full-on Batman, and there's a moment when he says, no, right here, full-on! All right. So, thank you, Danny. But yeah, we, Whedon was very much encouraging of using the Elfman Batman theme throughout the, the sequence, and this is, this is the moment where the Batmobile sort of shoots out of the, the flying fox in the final, uh, the final battle. So... Uh, really, it's not really in the movie that much. If you look up like compilations of the Batman theme in the Elfman score, it's in like less than a minute of the whole movie if you put them all together. So it's not really used okay. that much, but uh, it did it did uh, suffer the wrath of the Snyder fans online. But outside of of which, outside of that, you know, people enjoyed hearing it again. Some because of the '89 movie, others saying it brought them back to Lego Batman, of course. <laughs> so. oh man to your point yeah. about feeling old and this was yeah. years ago actually this i was feeling old at this point years ago it was when like one of the last transformers movies was out in the theater not bumblebee mm -hmm. the bay ones yeah and i was talking on set i was a pa at the time and there was a younger pa on there and we were talking about the transformers cartoon from the 80s and this girl was like, wait, are those movies based on a cartoon? <laughs> I was just like, <laughs> everyone else talking was just was like facepalm, like, oh, oh, oh my, my God. God, here we go. At least it was like everyone else was backing you up as opposed to like you're with a whole bunch of young people and you're the one who's the odd man out, you know? I, I, I Yeah, I had a little entourage at that point. But yeah, there's yes. some times where it's just like, <laughs> you know. You guys don't know anything. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> anyway. You guys suck. Yeah. Right, so uh, moving on to the next one, we have uh, more of an instance of the Elfman theme in 2017 with Justice League action. This is the Justice League cartoon that came out around the same time as uh, the Justice League movie. Batman, once again, voiced by Kevin Conroy. Uh, I think this is the last animated series that Kevin Conroy did, at least as a, a, re a regular. This is out so, now, right? It's on Amazon Prime now. It's on it the whole feels, series now. It feels like no one is talking about this. And and look, maybe it's just my algorithms online. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I, I'm have you seen it? Is it good? It's been good so far. It's it's very different from the like classic Justice League because it's done in the newer style where episodes are like 10 minutes long. So everything is just really yeah. fast paced. You don't really get a ton of like emotional shit. It's more just like fun action stuff with like characters learning to be more confident in themselves. Like th that's the type of stuff it is so i don't think it's as impactful as the dcau stuff but it is still fun and still plays around with characters we didn't really get to have much time with in the in the dcau such it as it sounds like you know, uh the, the, the 10 minute thing sounds like it's the tiktok generation like dude our mm. our attention spans are totally in the toilet and like giving kids the power of tiktok at a young age or instagram or whatever they're watching youtube mm -hmm. even like, I've heard somebody say that, like, you know, those 23, 24-minute lo Looney Tunes episodes are, like, long-form entertainment for kids. <laughs> I, they're I long. Mean, How long are it? <laughs> what about us? That uh, I mean, kid, kids, <laughs> most, our, our audience isn't kids, generally. Yeah, I, mean, I know. We, <laughs> we have the explicit <laughs> on us. <laughs> <laughs> we say fuck a lot. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but... But uh, yeah, I mean the ten minute thing. It God, it just that just it just sounds like that, man. I mean, I'm glad yeah. I'm glad movies and TV shows haven't given in to this just no. yet. Although I do think movies should we should have more ninety minute movies. Yeah, Not, that's true too. Everything is like two hours and twenty minutes or some shit these days, and it's a little much. But yeah. I digress. John Wick three, 
I mean, John Wick 4 is a close to three hours. Uh, yeah, I have not <laughs> seen that as of this recording, but I Same will here. soon. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so, yeah, they did an homage to Batman the Animated Series, as we see here. This is the episode Timeshare, where Batman and Blue Beetle are forced to go back in time and witness a younger Batman standing in front of the lightning. And Kevin Ripel uh, does the score and sort of reflects the arrangement that's in the beginning of BTAS. Obviously, this is the big homage here. So uh, that's why the elephant theme is brought back. We're going to stick to TV stuff for a bit. Uh, so there's a composer named David Russo who has worked on Batman-related shows, including Gotham, Pennyworth, and Gotham Knights, the new one on CW. Uh, I've seen this in a YouTube comment. We could not pull it up because he's got a million videos of his scores. But Russo has stated that he has paid homage to different Batman composers in his scores for Gotham, including Elfman's. And you can even hear Elfman's Batman theme at different points when you listen to the scores in certain episodes, including the series finale of Gotham. It's not necessarily him adopting the Batman theme as the Batman theme of the Gotham universe. Russo kind of just writes it in subtly uh, and has his own Batman theme when Batman does show up in the finale of Gotham. But, but that's kind of the Elfman stuff. That's kind of how you have to do it if you want to like, what do you call it? Um, pay homage, but yeah. still strike out on your own at the same time. I think so too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Elfman's Batman theme is also seemingly playing during the new Gotham Knights show when Batman's body is discovered, which is a shame, but uh, in terms of Batman's life in that universe, but it is a cool homage to there. <laughs> Batman's in there. life in that universe, <laughs> i.e. it's not there. It's <laughs> not, it's have just one. not there. He doesn't, he bar- <laughs> he's, he's, he's just not existing at this point in the rest of it. Uh, but yeah, he, he goes down, but... Uh, the Elfman theme was also brought into the CW in the crossover Crisis on Infinite Earths, where we had a glimpse at Earth 89. Robert Wool returned to the role of Alexander Knox to make a quick cameo, and uh, multiple composers were involved in this arrangement, led by Blake Neely, Nathaniel Bloom, Daniel James Chan, and Sherry Chung. And uh, they used a lot of the different iconic themes throughout Crisis on Infinite Earths because it's Crisis on Infinite Earths. Um, Blake Neely was the main composer on a lot of those Arrowverse shows. Uh, and so he's the one that came out with the, the Flash theme that I think is probably the most popular out of these. But he also did the theme song for the 2021 DC fandom called A Time for Heroes. I think they just play it in the beginning. Anybody who was around for DC fandom uh, back then who, who watched it. But uh, it mixed in all the different iconic themes, including the John Williams Superman theme, but also the Danny Elfman Batman theme. So nice. uh, that's another use of that there. And then we're catching up now. And last year in 2022, it became the theme of another animated Batman. We talked about John Wick before, but Keanu Reeves' Batman theme is also the Elfman theme in League of Super Pets, the animated film that is (laughs) the better DC movie led by Dwayne Johnson. This is uh, (laughs) my wife's favorite DC movie, by the way. Really? (laughs) Because she likes pets, she likes she likes animals. So like, it's just kind of a, it's kind of a win, like a no a no brainer that it would be her her favorite. Yeah. So yeah, they they use the Elfman score in the trailer when they reveal Batman, as well as uh, in the movie itself. It's arranged by Steven Jablonski, and you can hear it in the tracks on the soundtrack. Uh, the tracks being "Terrifying Villains," "Deadly Assassins," and "Super Family." So, uh, it's another Batman who adopted the theme. This uh, movie. In- was sort of yeah. slept on. I mean, it's not like the best ever, but it's like a solid yeah. B minus. It's fine. It was, okay. yeah, it was cool. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Again, it's the, it's the better. <laughs> Out of the DC movies last year, it's the better Dwayne Johnson one for sure. It's way better than <laughs> stupid ass Black Adam. So. That, that shit was suck dude <laughs> <I didn't... laughs> i'm sorry if you guys out there if some people like that movie and i, and I have some friends that like that movie uh, like kind of below <laughs> but like i just i just wasn't wasn't for me it didn't use the danny elfman theme that wasn't that wasn't <laughs> part of its problem <laughs> <laughs> that's one of the problems i had any movie that's that doesn't you're... have it <laughs> <laughs> it's an immediate uh, couple points <laughs> off uh in the same year they released the video game multiverses where Batman is, once again, voiced by Kevin Conroy, one of his last performances, unfortunately, but not his last, or his last in a video game, since he's going to be in the Suicide Squad, Kill the Justice League video game. Uh, But he is, once again, accompanied by the Danny Elfman uh, Batman theme arranged by Stephen Barton. 
So I think I read that use. this. So this game was in the news like today or yesterday. Like its mm. user base just, I think, fell off dramatically. Really? It had it had kind of a good period. It was doing pretty well. Mm-hmm. Um, people buying it, you know, liking it, and then it just boom, just like <laughs> people just stopped. <laughs> um, and maybe Jeez. they'll come back. Maybe they'll get some cool cool DLC. I think it's. I mean, multiverses, man. I tried it. It's cool enough, or like How a little bit, but like, mm-hmm. it, so it's a slightly different genre from like injustice, obviously, like where like a one on one fighter, mm-hmm. or like they call these like party fighters or something, where they kind of base off Smash Brothers. And I was just never much of a Smash Brothers fan. I like I like your Tekkens. I like your Street Fighters. I like your Mortal Kombat's. Your Killer Instincts. That's the that's the shit for me. I don't. I never really got into Smash Brothers. Mm-hmm. So I mean. Yeah. It, it was it's fine it's fine it's cool I get it it's like a party but it's just less my thing. Yeah, it's like Smash Brothers with like all these different characters who you might know. It's just like okay, this is random as fuck in terms of the selection that they have here. <laughs> well, I mean, they want it. They want a whole DC universe, which I I know. Like not not when I say DC universe, we're talking Scooby Doo and fucking everybody. I yeah. think I think uh, fucking um. There's Game of Thrones characters in it too. Like it's like Warner Brothers all over the place. I think Harry Potter characters are in it. Like it's they've got everything. Anything wanna, that Warner Brothers owns, it's in multiverses. I think. Which I I think that's that's kind of fun. I mean, it doesn't bother me. It's just a the overall gameplay style. <clears throat> it's just not how like I remember going over to my local comic book shop way back in the day when I was in high school, and they were playing Smash Brothers there, and I was like kind of like saying they're not even fighting and they're like well (laughs) they're snarky comic book people they were like well what are they what are they doing then (laughs) you know like immediate (laughs) immediate pushback Mm -hmm. it just wasn't my kind of game but uh yeah it's just kind of i don't know it's fine it's yeah it's fine i have some friends that like this too it's cool whatever nice well we're now moving into 2023 where the flash trailer played the elfman theme of course when keaton was revealed and we know it's going to be in the movie. There has been video footage behind the scenes of Andy, Mus- Andy Muschietti listening in on composer Benjamin Wolfish doing the score, and he is doing an arrangement of the Danny Elfman theme in the movie. So that's definitely going to be in there. Uh, now, nice. Ben Affleck's also in this movie. It's unknown how Wolfish, the composer, is going to handle that, either using Elfman's theme for Affleck's Batman again or using one of the themes from the Snyder films, either the BVS one or Justice League or if he's going to compose his own for Affleck, or given the fact that this is probably the most likely, Affleck's only in it for like five minutes, he might not even have a theme at all to himself in this. So, Dude, if, he, if it really is like five minutes, you know, it's it probably won't have one. Yeah. If he does, it's cool. maybe like a a quick 30-second thing. Well, yeah. maybe not 30 seconds, but like, I don't know. Yeah, it'll be, <laughs> it, I don't know. Don't I, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is don't expect much. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't be expecting a full triumphant return or the BVS Batman theme. I'm like, yeah, I'm pretty sure we're hearing the Elfman theme throughout all of it and then some cool action-type music when Affleck's on screen on that Bat cycle. So, yes. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if Affleck is basically seen in it in the suit in that you know Bat cycle scene and then as Bruce Wayne in like that one scene that's in the trailer and then that's it for the whole thing. That's it. Yep. It'll be fine. Uh, now, Keaton... His return was not only supposed to be in The Flash, but also in the canceled Batgirl film, and there is confirmation it did have a score. The Batgirl theme was canceled. It had a score composed by Natalie Holt, uh, who got Danny Elfman's blessing. Elfman looking very carrot-toppy here. Uh, And uh, (laughs) she wanted to use his theme for Michael Keaton's Batman, even met met up with him, and when WB canceled the film, they took this picture together of them frowning (laughs) over the cancellation of Batgirl. So. Looks like he's uh, just gotten back from the gym with that shirt, too. <laughs> yeah, that too. <laughs> so, yeah, that brings us to pretty much ca- catching up to two- 2023. Overall, Elfman's Batman theme is one of the rare superhero themes to apply across different continuities, specifically four. Here we go. Dan put this compilation together of all the Elfman Batman. Wow. Michael Keaton in the Burton films, Flash and the canceled Batgirl film. Kevin Conroy in all the DCAU animated shows, video games, and animated movies, as well as Conroy in Justice League Action and in Multiverses. Uh, the, of course, the Troy Baker Lego Batman that we see at the top. 
uh, Bruce Thomas in the on-star Batman commercials, Ben Affleck in the Justice League cut directed by Joss Whedon, and Keanu Reeves in the League of Super Pets. So <laughs> it's these are all the ones who have been blessed with the Elfman theme so far, at least. I'm sure that will carry over soon, even after this uh, this episode goes out there. So it just goes to show this is the most iconic one. Out of the serious Batman, at least we all know the the more even more iconic one for the silly version. Uh, I mean, yeah, Adam West is like its own thing, but uh, yeah. yeah, it's it's you know, I just the Elfman one can kind of go to different Batman. Look, it goes to even silly ones like Lego Batman. So that's true. Yeah. So it's like it's kind of more flexible in that way. Whereas the Adam West one is 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 cool. It's my second favorite one. Uh, yeah. but it, it can kind of just go for West, really. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. just too iconic, it's too point. iconic, too in its own lane. Yeah, yeah, and it kind of goes to show, too, like, this is a character who, one of the cool things that I find about Batman is the fact that there are so many different versions to appreciate. There are so many different adaptations uh, that we yeah. see here that you have different things to appreciate about each one, and it kind of goes to show that the Elfman theme, one of the things that makes it work so well is its flexibility, too, for all these others that it could be used. You know, it can be very, you know, foreboding and tragic, but it could also be used as a cool action theme. It's even kind of arranged as sort of a love theme in the 89 movie. Like, it's it has flexibility. Uh, and that's kind of goes with a character who already has that sort of flexibility, too, across all these different adaptations. Nice. So, and with that, that is superhero stuff you should know. And final summation, Elfman rules. Yes. <laughs> Elfman fucking rules. <laughs> Keep using the TRT, my friend. Yes, yes. <laughs> Big thanks to Dan, our research assistant, for gathering the visuals for this YouTube experience. And uh, we're going to go into some comments, some of which are from the Shazam episode that we're trying to get more people to watch. <laughs> so <laughs> It's not going to Dude, Warner Brothers couldn't get anybody to go see the goddamn movie. <laughs> They're not going to see our coverage of it. I wish they would. Knock on wood, they will. But probably not. <clears throat> Ander Ortega actually sent us, one of our commenters, Ander, sent us the John August script, Billy Batson and the Legend of Shazam, that is now sitting in our inbox. Thank you, Ander, oh, for that. You. We might cover that at some point in the future if this character ever gets more. I mean, we've gotten enough fan requests on it that maybe we'll just do it at some point just to say fuck it. Uh, but for the time <laughs> being, I think we're going to take a break from the character. <laughs> Um, but, I mean, we both like Shazam to a certain degree, I think. Yes. And it's just, you know, people aren't even up to that degree, you yeah. know, it seems like. Yeah. So, whatever, oh, man, well. whatever, <laughs> you know. But if it's... Dustin Gibbons is not among them. He commented on our Shazam episode on the unmade script by William Goldman saying, Hello, originally, the wisdom of Solomon was more so about knowing right from wrong. This makes I see. sense, I think. So it's, it's less to do with being a super genius or a telepath, as it seems like in the Goldman script. Uh, also, in the Golden Age, Billy and the Captain changed spots. Thor and Dr. Blake was like that at first, too. Two different people changing spots. Eventually, it was decided that Billy was the personality of both people. Okay. I like it better that way anyway. Otherwise, I, it's just like, uh, okay, you're just a different guy. This is a cool comment. Thank you for that. I, I do think, like, if they... If they give him the wisdom of Solomon, this isn't knowledge, right? This is this is, this is not like trivia. This is wisdom. So if he automatically has yeah. a bunch of fucking wisdom, he's not going to act like a kid anymore. True. So it's going to change his whole fucking personality. And uh, maybe, I mean, I, I assume that's why they don't do that. Like, if you if you, he's going to sound like... Um, like a sensei or something, the whole, <laughs> you know, like the whole time, which mm -hmm. is, I'd probably like that too, but like, I could see why they want to kind of keep that, keep that, you know, away from Billy, uh, in mm -hmm. the story. Um, just cause it, it'll change his character entirely. So yeah. yeah. Paint the fence. All right. So <laughs> on to Jeremy Harris. Uh, Jeremy says, thank you guys so much for the shout out. I'm definitely not a fan of Superman three though. Apparently in our comments section, a lot of people are, <laughs> So, you know, Superman uh, homepage also like had a whole deal. They were talking about the their favorite Superman three um, scenes and stuff. They had a shout out. Oh, yeah. They had a, a call to action for their fans or whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
it was kind of what you expect, you know. <laughs> Just the junkyard fight. Jun- a lot of junkyard between. stuff, yeah, yeah ma- mainly that. Clark. Yeah, mm-hmm. I'd, I'd say that's the highlight. Uh, I would definitely, if you can contact, oh, he'd be definitely interested if you can contact Ilya Salkine to confirm the only reason it could be true. Okay, so he's referring to us talking about how uh, they almost removed Christopher Reeve from Superman 3, uh, based off of Jeremy's previous comment, including a rumor I read that they were considering Tony Danza. So uh, Jeremy Harris says, the only reason it could be true was in Still Me by Christopher Reeve. I think he mentioned the writing style of the Newmans and also hated the direction and also unhappy about Donner being fired as well. I mean, considering the final film, we can understand that. So moving on. Yeah, uh, thank you. Dina Guy uh, commented on our Flash episode, the one where we covered David Goyer's Flash script, saying, all kidding aside, there actually has been serious redhead discrimination with comic book characters recently in <laughs> live action and even in the comics. We even talked to Slight Rebellion off Madison about this in the $10 tier. Mm-hmm. Uh, Lightning Lad and Jimmy Olsen have both been made black recently in animation and comics and live action. The CW changed Roy Harper, Wally West, Pat Dugan, Stripe, and Lana Lang, Hawk Girl. Carrie Kelly, Iris West, Kate Kane, Elongated Man, and more. The movies have the movies have changed Captain Boomerang, The Riddler, Cheetah, Jim Gordon, Cyclone, and Vicky Vale. I'm not as familiar with Marvel, but MJ was not a redhead in the newest Spider-Man trilogy. So, this is yeah, this has been kind of a weird thing where like the redheaded characters are no longer really redhead in it, and some of it is to you know push for more of the diversity and representation, and a lot of it sometimes is the uh, representation of african-americans obviously all the stuff that dina guy listed are not always instances of um you know black people replacing gingers but that does seem to happen weirdly a lot you know a lot of the stuff that has been listed here seems to be that kind of case it's just i just think it's it's weird it's weird that it's so much of it that's true but i think that my read on this is that they're you know they they, they don't want to replace, like, their main white dude, but mm-hmm. they will replace these backup characters that are, like, there's a lot of ginger backup characters in right. in the comics, in the comic lore already. And maybe that was just how they wanted to have gingers in comics <laughs> back then. Right. And uh, so there just happens to be a lot of secondary or and or ancillary ginger characters and it's just more easily to, it's more it's it's easier to put a a black actor in those positions, I guess, is what the, again is what probably what the producers are thinking, and uh, yeah, that's just it's just kind of like coincidence, I guess, a little bit. You, mm-hmm. But it's like yeah, you're going from like the stereotypical like second banana characters essentially, <laughs> right? You know, uh like uh supporting cast which was a lot of gingers and now they're just you know now the supporting cast is mainly black i don't know it, it is a weird phenomenon though for sure yeah i mean i mean some of these two there it depends on the interpretation like jim gordon yeah. is not always ginger you know the riddler you know a lot of right. times you see him he's got black hair so it uh, it depends on that but i think you've got the right I think you have the right analysis on like why this is, and and noticeably, yeah. everybody Dina Guy listed is not like the main person in that title, with the possible exception of Wally West. But noticed when they changed Wally West, it was on the CW when he was kind of a sidekick for like three seasons. So right. like, that's different compared to being like the Flash uh, during that time. Uh, though I'll also say that uh, even if they kind of don't bring in the ginger side of Wally West. They also haven't really made Barry Allen blonde. So there's mm, that too. Weird. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, but thank I you, don't know. Dina Guy, for this comment. Yes. Thank you. On to the shout outs. We've got a lot more. Wow. Yeah, that is true. Um, where do I begin? <laughs> 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 thank you, everybody on this board, of course, for sure. And uh, Aurelie, we want to thank. Some of our newer people, which include, um, we'll start off with Daimon or Damon. Uh, let us know if we're saying that right. And thank you to Michael G, Slight Rebellion of Madison, Meteor P, and Christian R. And we want to thank our other supporters as well. Thank you, everybody, on this list. Our The fire rises and continues to rise. Indeed. And uh, we've told you about our friends here. 
and we want you to do us a little favor. We want you to tell all your friends about us.